Hello and welcome. I am with a special guest on this broadcast, Australian High Commission to India, Philip Green. And thank you for your time and thank you for uh, agreeing to meet us. Great to be with you, Nitin. You've been here for six months now. What's been your experience, India, Australia, and of India? Uh, well, you know, it's been fast and furious. Okay. I uh, began with a bang in the middle of uh, extraordinary G20, traveling around your country, uh, uh, having my ministers and then my prime minister uh, meeting with uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, and then the achievement of an impressive G20 here. Um, that was a lot and a big start to my operation here but you know we, we have a we have a very wide ranging relationship which has strong defense and security elements big trade and economic elements and increasingly uh in developments relating to what we call the human bridge the large number of people of indian origin in australia so that you know that takes me to every part of this country uh and it engages me with every part of your society and let me say what I, I really enjoy is that here people are thinking hard about their country, about the region and the world. They're articulate. They can be argumentative. <laughs> they are. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful society in which to test one's ideas and to learn and grow. So that's what I'm really enjoying. Well, that, that I'm glad about. But... Uh by all accounts, the India-Australia relationship uh, is probably at its peak. So the question always comes to my mind is, from here, where? Yeah. Where do you go? So, I know what you mean. <laughs> you mean that we're at a very high point. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't, I, I, yeah, okay, I don't want peak. to be the peak in <laughs> not my <a> commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, <laughs> I, you know, I have an unmet uh, ambition. And, and of course, we're, we're in a great spot and... Right. I am standing on the shoulders of giants, but we, we want to have a second phase of the free trade agreement. Um, we, we want to deepen our already strong uh, defense and security arrangements. We think that there's more that we can do in fields like maritime domain awareness. Uh, we, we want to drive more the Australian, the community of Indians in Australia to make a difference in our commercial links. That's nearly 4% of our population now. They have, and they know this country, they know its business. They have a role to play in trying to drive us to the next phase. And, and I'm particularly excited about the role that Australia can play in the renewables push by India. You know, I, I want Australian critical minerals to be the founding elements in your EV scene. I want uh, Australian uh, polysilicon to be the core of a massive solar uh, energy uh, PV manufacturing capability here. And I'd love to see Australian green iron be part of the production of green steel in India. So uh, we got a ways yet to go. Oh, yes, of course. And commercial relationship, like you mentioned, but uh, more particularly, I'm interested in the people to people connection like you yeah. you talked about. Um, Indian students were the first uh, wave, I would say. There were some professionals earlier. Uh, what are the kind of um, Indian professionals or Indian uh, origin people you would like uh, to be engaged with Australia? Not just those who are there in Australia right now, but uh, if anybody wants to go to Australia, what kind of influx you would you uh, encourage? Oh, gosh, it's that would be very wide. Let, let, me, let me say this to you. I don't think it's very well understood. I mean... Uh, people of Indian origin are making a big contribution to our society. Right. Uh, and, and our census details show mm -hmm. that uh, people of Indian origin in Australia are more likely to have higher education than people from other places in Australia. People of Indian origin are more likely to open their own business mm -hmm. than other people, other communities in Australia. And this is interesting. People of Indian origin are more likely to be involved in social and community groups in Australia. Mm. So, uh, this is a group that's making a big contribution yeah. to our society. Look, we've obviously got a lot of people who are strong in IT. Mm. We've got a lot of people who are strong uh, in business. Um, but, you know, there, there, are, uh, there are many other uh, fields in which Indians can make their way in Australia where a 
very diverse uh, cosmopolitan society with a, a, a widely variant sort of um, uh, sort of economy. So there there is no real limit to the sort of the Indians who can make a, a difference to our society. I suppose so. And in fact, uh, like you said, Australia also wants to be part of India's story, the growth story and the future technologies. Uh, coming to defense and security, yeah. which again has uh, really progressed uh, much faster than uh, most other elements in this relationship. Uh, you had uh, exercise Malabar, where Indian troops have uh, been there. What next in that uh, aspect really? Well, w we will be doing more and more uh, complex uh, and more frequent exercises. You mentioned Malabar, Oz Index, Milan, now uh, Waramanga will be here next month for that. Uh, and interoperability between the many platforms that we share, like the P-8, for instance, crucial maritime surveillance aircraft, uh, is something we're looking, looking for. I think we could hope for beyond interoperability to interchangeability. Mm. More Australian servicemen working in Indian platforms with Indian platforms. Could we not have uh, Indian Defence Force personnel in our headquarters um, sharing some of the load, offering some of their expertise, sure. and perhaps learning something as well? So, look, we're going to do more. And it's going to be more frequent and it's going to be deeper. But I think uh, I really want to find a new level of intimacy that interchangeability characterizes. That is my ambition. In, in all aspects of the relationship, not just defense? Yeah, but I think of that, I mean, but let's, let's be real about this, Nitin. I mean, the defense and security relationship is sensitive. It's at the core of our nation. It's core of your nation. Right. It's the sort of thing that only countries that are engaging at a highly trusted level get into. Right. So that's why I, I, yeah, I, I highlight that. that. But I mean, yeah. you know, do, do I want more Indian investors to be looking at Australia's for their supply mm -hmm. chains? Absolutely. Yeah. Do, do I want more Australian firms with smart innovations, let's say in the tech sector, sure. to find scale and global supply chains via India, whereas they might have found that before? from Silicon Valley or Singapore? Sure. Yes, I do. Yeah. So uh, integration between our economy as well as between our uh, security services is something that I'm looking for. Yeah. Before broadening the discussion, uh, you know, uh, one of your universities has now uh, come to open a campus in Gujarat. Mm. Uh, is that also another uh, aspect of the relationship? Education exchanges education uh, facilities for uh, Indian students, both in India and in Australia? Uh, indeed. I, I think this is one of the real great new horizons. Y you mentioned large number of Indian students who go to Australia every year. That'll continue. That is good. Mm. Um, but it shouldn't be a one-way street. Right. Uh, and now that your government has opened windows which allow foreign universities to open branch campuses here and and let's understand the reality here uh gift city has allowed the opportunity for foreign branch campuses to open from anywhere in the world but the only two in the world mm -hmm. who have chosen to take up that opportunity are australian australians yes Seekin, which is now open and inaugurated and wollongong which will follow later this year right so uh I like to think of it this way. The, the, the student movement business will go on, but it shouldn't be a one-way street. True. And the opening of branch campuses here in India will give Indian families new opportunities. Mm. The, the opportunity to get a high-quality Australian degree with an Australian testament mm. and all of the prestige that's associated with that at a fraction of the cost. Yes. And, and without the dislocation of a family yeah. member being a long way overseas. So many people want to continue to go to Australia. We welcome that. Uh, but this opens a new option for Indian families. Yes, talking about going to Australia, I think it's one of the favourite tourism destinations for Indians. Not yet favourite enough. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> one, of your, uh, one of your airline executives said to me the other day, he said, every Indian's uh, objective is to go to Australia one day. 
your objective is to make sure that one day is this year. <laughs> and so that's what I invite yeah. Indians to do. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> no, it's a great destination. And so, so many uh, options available in yep. Australia. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And I think more and more Indians with disposable incomes will certainly, you know, like to go to Australia, explore uh, various options there. But let me come back to um, the other uh, aspect of the relationship that both Australia and India are members of the Quad, yep. for instance. Now, uh, where is the Quad going and what would do you think India and Australia can do together to push Quad further ahead? Yeah, look, the last time I came to India prior to becoming High Commissioner, I came on a mission as the person leading the Quad uh, for, for Australia. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's interesting to con contrast that, you know, that was only uh, 2019 mm -hmm. and at that time, the Quad was undertaking occasional senior officials meetings right. on the sidelines of other meetings. Mm. There was no work program. There was no fixed agenda. Sometimes those meetings issued communiques. If they did, they were slender things of a few lines. And you run the video forward to 2024 right. and you've got annual Quad summits. You've got working groups. You've got work programs. You've got... Uh, activities going on between different ministers. So we've come a long way uh, and the Quad is now established as a fixture in the regional mm. infrastructure and I think that's a good thing. Um, we need to continue to deliver on our promises on maritime security, on delivering health benefits mm. to uh, people across the Indo-Pacific. Um, we need to do more on infrastructure. Um, we, we, we first of all need to d deliver on our promise and then we need to show that there is, uh, there is even more that the Quad can do. And, you know, I, I'm very confident about that. I mean, I see uh, the Indian governor's custodians of this year very active in terms of the things that they would uh, like to see us do next. So I, I'm very confident that the next phase of the Quad is going to be just as good as the ones that have come. And India is, of course, the chair this year for uh, the Quad Summit. Any idea when is it likely to take place? I'll leave that to our distinguished chair to identify <laughs> when uh, 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 other members can come and be part of a quad summit. What, what I will say about this is really important, Natin, is that uh, Prime Minister Albanese, I've spoken to him about this. Uh, he's very keen on the quad. He'd be very keen to come to somebody very keen to come back to India. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he'll be flexible to make sure he's available uh, whenever we can find a date. Right. Looking at the um, various conflicts that have broken out in the past uh, couple of years, and not talking about just Russia, Ukraine, but what's happening in the Middle East now, uh, how does that affect Australia's uh, economy? Does it affect, one, and two, what can Australia, India together or alone uh, do to bring down the temperatures, if at all? It's not just our economy, isn't it, Nitin? Of course, that uh, is affected and you see that shipping routes are being elongated, right. uh, which will affect all of us, prices. But we worry about a world which seems to be increasingly having to deal with major conflicts. Uh, and that, that is difficult for a country uh, like ours, difficult for any country. Um, the humanitarian toll in Gaza is terrible, Chen, and the situation is dire. My foreign minister has been there in the last 10 days in an effort to add whatever we can to the efforts to find some sort of way forward there. We have long favoured um, humanitarian pauses to uh, allow supplies to get in and people to get out where that's possible. We have advocated for those humanitarian pauses to be able to lead to a sustainable ceasefire. And we want that to occur, but that ceasefire can't be one way. Right. Uh, yes, we want the attacks in uh, Gaza to stop, but also Hamas needs to cease its destabilizing actions. And of course, to uh, we can never forget the horror of, uh, of those initial attacks on citizens, those dreadful terrorist attacks. So um, we're very concerned about this situation uh, and we're concerned about a world in which there seems to be, well, there is 
a, a proliferation of military expenditure without a balancing capability to manage conflict. Right. So talking about conflict, there's always this overhang or the shadow of uh, the China factor in relations uh, relationships uh, of different countries. I mean, Australia has its own bilateral relationship or problems. India has, of course, uh, last four years have been uh, terrible uh, India-China. How do you see that panning out in the Indo-Pacific? I mean, you know, Chinese always uh, keep telling us that you are all ganging up against us. Is that the way you see it? Well, I don't. Um, and we are stabilizing our bilateral relationship with China after a period of uncomfortable instability. And of course, we should all want a stable relationship sure. with China. So it's a good thing that we have resumed dialogue. Uh, and it's a good thing that the, uh, the, the rhetorical temperature has come down. And our approach to China is that, you know, we will cooperate where we can, Lord. disagree with where we must, mm -hmm. and always act in our national interest and mm -hmm. always act uh, with our partners. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are clear-eyed about what, is important in a bilateral relationship which can deliver some benefit. Mm -hmm. We're also conscious that we're also ready to call out things that China does that are not satisfactory. So we recently had divers in international oh, yes. waters <laughs> uh, and they were subject to uh, an impact of sonar. And we've been very clear that that sort of unprofessional and dangerous conduct is not acceptable. Right. So I think India is in the same position that, you know, while you want to do um, more dialogue if possible, but if they can't, then uh, we'll have to take action in India's national interest. But I can't let you go without asking more cricket bilateral series <laughs> or one-day series, India-Australia. That's a new rivalry, right, in the town, uh, except uh, the Ashes, perhaps. Well, I mean, you know, it's a question, isn't it? What's the greatest rivalry now? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, look, it, it's, uh, it's a wonderful part of our bilateral life. Uh, it's difficult for me to have a meeting with anybody in your country without <laughs> talking about cricket. Yeah. And that's a pleasure. Sure. Uh, yeah. It's a passion of mine as well. Um, it's... It, it also touches on our national life. Um, it, it's said that the Australian cricket captain is the second most important person in Australia. And, uh, and his character is an important sure. feature of the Australian character. Mm. You know, I was very impressed by the way the Indian cricket team carried itself during that series. And, and I was totally impressed by the way in which your authorities carried out what was a splendid tournament that we got so much enjoyment out of. But I, 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 we, we, we hope that uh, Indians think kindly and even with respect on our nation because of the way in which, because of the character of our cricket team, we certainly do about yours. Right. That's a great way to you know, conclude our conversation. Thanks very much for uh, your time and again, insights into where we are as far as India-Australia relations are concerned. Hopefully, we'll have more conversations going forward during your tenure. We definitely will. Great to be with you, Nitin. Thank you. Thanks. So, do keep watching Strat News Global. You know where to reach us. Uh, your feedback is important. And of course, keep subscribing to our YouTube channel and of course, the social media handles. Uh, we'll come back with more with uh, other interesting personalities, but for, for the time being, it's goodbye.